I mean, my name is John Perna. Um, I've been in the church for just about six years. Um, my family and I, we moved from uh, New Jersey uh, to North Carolina. Maybe some of you can relate to that. I know we have a lot of people coming down from the north. Uh, in New Jersey, I served as a uh, police officer for 25 years before retiring from the police force. I also um, at some point went to law school and started a law practice in New Jersey, which I'm actually um, moved the practice to North Carolina. I'm also a, um, a trust and estate attorney as, as well. And so I think I can give a unique, a unique perspective on internet safety and so forth. When I was an officer, I left the department as a commander of the investigative division, uh, which meant basically that all, all investigations came through my office. I had a team of about 20 uh, officers that I Supervised. Translate some of them. Translate. Yeah. We have to translate them in Arabic. So yeah, you speak English. I'll translate. Oh, okay. Slow down, basically. And I have to translate. I have to use your microphone. Oh, okay. So. All right. And then he will John Bernabe Uru, who can from New Jersey, can police officer, can police. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. There you go. Okay. okay, so I'm going to try to talk in segments. I'll try to give something out and we'll get the translation back. Um, so to wrap up my, my background, essentially I was in charge of a lot of investigations which did involve online activity, uh, re, whether it be with adults and or children. Okay. Uh, you can see the first picture. I think that's actually um, kind of telling because uh, unattended children on the internet, this is kind of where this picture was taken from. And you have uh, the one child covering the eyes of the younger child, but both children probably should not be unattended on the computer. Okay, so our goals for today we want to understand what our children are doing online. We want to keep our children safe when they're online. We want to teach our children to make smart choices when they're online. We want to start a discussion about internet safety with our children now, while they're in the developing years. And to understand parent responsibility and liability. <laughs> Okay. So how did children get online to begin with? And these are just some of the main ways on their mobile device, handheld device, uh, smartphone. Uh, okay. okay, some of the popular virtual worlds that children interact with online are um, Pop Tropica, Club Penguin, Wineville. Some are good, some are not so good. These are some of the alternatives kids have when they're first starting out when they go online. The main thing is any, any online platform that your children will be using, this is the most important part. You should be trying it out before they try it out. So if you're going to allow your child to go online on a certain program, you need to, you need to get online first and, and explore that program before you allow your child to start using it. 
قبل ما ولادكم تروحوا على الانترنت ويخشوا على السايس او يلعبوا على حاجات لو سمحتوا انتوا جربوها بنفسيكم قبل ما ولادكم يخشوا على السايس دي. Some of the social networking sites are sites such as Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, and, and so forth. Uh, these, these call for the users to create profiles, which are, pro and the profile is essentially information about the child that they post up online ahead of time. These days, sites that are on Facebook, MySpace, or Twitter, or Forum Spring, we are going to have to be a person who is on the site today. Social networking it also allows the child to communicate with their friends in social settings and also be able to find people that have similar interests to them. Okay. Texting is another way to get up online, uh, instant messaging and so forth. Uh, texting is another medium to be able to take online materials and, and be able to transfer them electronically to friends and, and, and so forth. Okay. There are video sharing sites as well, such as YouTube. Uh, it's probably the most popular where you can go up online and access just about any type of video that's up on that network. Getting back to online games, <clears throat> we mentioned this up front. Remember that when the children are up on their Xbox, most likely they're communicating with people across across the globe actually playing the games along with them and transferring information back and forth in addition to playing the game they can they can com use it as a communication channel as well okay so this screen represents the four main concerns that we should have with our children. So we're kind of moving now into the meat of the, um, of the presentation. And we're going to look at these four main categories. First one being cyberbullying. The second one is disturbing content. Your child viewing content that they should not be, it's not age appropriate or it's illegal content that could be considered illegal. Um, viruses and spyware, when your children are up online and they're, they're going back and forth, most likely they're visiting sites that are loaded with viruses and spyware. Those uh, viruses and so forth get downloaded to the computer or they may be simply passing those viruses along, infecting other people's computers. And then finally, the, the last main category is sexual predators. Understand that, unfortunately, there are uh, people that want to do harm to children. We call them sexual predators, and they, they're up online. They're posing as other children uh, to befriend your children and develop a relationship so that they can take the relationship from the online setting to the actual real life setting in terms of acting out on on the relationship that they've established. It's just four main categories so basically. <laughs> Okay, so cyberbullying is the posting or forwarding of private embarrassing messages to others. Tricking someone into revealing embarrassing information, spreading malicious rumors, or stealing passwords. So to sum that up, is your, your, you or your children or people that you may know essentially are 
are distributing information about other people to cause embarrassment, shame, and so forth. And, and we call that cyberbullying. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. This this happened happened few times, and I saw it. A boy would send a girl a request to take a, an image of herself without clothes. Yeah. And then he would take that image and give it to everybody. She thought that he's a person that loves her, cares about her. Yeah. Turns out to be somebody who will destroy her. Yeah, that's coming up actually. Yes, we'll be talking about that. that. That's a bully. That's a bully. He want money. He want whatever. Okay. So. I presented a, a, an example of a, a North Carolina case. It's State of North Carolina versus Robert Bishop. And this is a case where the, the, the child and victim were students at the same high school. And the child actor posted several comments on Facebook about the victim, basically calling him a homosexual um, and saying that he should have beat him up and, and so forth. Um, the person receiving, the other student, the victim, received that message from the student, went to the parent, the parent went to law enforcement, and eventually they arrested uh, Robert Bishop and charged him with cyberbullying. And so this is real, it happens every single day. Unfortunately, um, the, the, the child was a juvenile at the time, but they still charged the child as an adult. And so, in, do you want to catch up on that? And uh, الأهل بتوع الولد بتقال عليه أنت عندك شروط جنسي قدموا زي طلب وراح للمحكمة وبقت قضية وتعرفت إنها فتونة بتاعة الإنترنت. One thing about North Carolina, North Carolina does not have specific statutes or laws to address children doing the wrong thing online. We, we call this a legal trap, and I'll explain why. So what North Carolina does is they take their general statutes and they apply them to children, and they will charge children as adults under those statutes. Other states have not gone that way. Other states have created statutes specifically to address minors cyberbullying or, or using inappropriate material online um, and so forth, th making threats online. They've taken statu a bunch of statutes and they've used them for juveniles. North Carolina does not do that. They have general statutes that would apply to an adult or a child. And if the child makes a mistake, they get charged under the adult statute and they get treated as an adult up until certain ages. So understand that you really need to take a look at what your children are doing online because you, you could conceivably have a major problem if, if they are passing along information that's coming to them that, that's a, that would violate an adult statute. How about the parents liability? We're going to get to that. Yes, the par North Carolina does have parent liability statutes and we'll talk more about that in a, in a few slides, but absolutely. Uh, 
زي ما هي في ولايات تانية ما بيعملوش الحكاية دي خالص لكن هنا في نورث كارولينا نورث كارولينا قوانين الكبار تطبع الصغيرين So I would say what we take from this is that we should not send any text message that has that's the message yes. on, but so they watch what's going on. Right, right, and we'll talk about this as we, as we go forward, absolutely. This is North Carolina's cyberbullying statute, and again, this, this is 14-458.1. Uh, it's unlawful for any person to use a computer or computer network to do any of the following with the intent to intimidate, torment a minor. Uh, build fake profiles or websites, pose as a minor, uh, enter a chat room, electronic mail, etc. So essentially, the cyberbullying statute addresses that behavior when one child or even an adult is trying to intimidate the other child through electronic messaging through electronic means, meaning uh, texting or whether it be on the internet and in chat groups and so forth, Instagram, instant messaging and so forth. And again, if your child is involved with that and your child happens to be a minor, your child will be exposed to this statute, which is really written for an adult. This is not written for a child. Um, so that's what we call the legal trap in North Carolina. There's no age-specific statute on this type of activity. It's kind of written for an adult and applied to the child if they are the violator. بالاسباب الاتيه ان اول حاجه يعني لو واحد هنا انه يحرق او يتعب او يقلب يهدد واحد ماينور يعني تحت السن القانوني او يعمل ويب سايت مش صحيحه غلط يبين نفسه ان هو تحت السن القانوني او يخش على تشات روم او يبعث مسج رساله سواء مسج الكترونيك او تكست أو يتابع واحد تحت السن القانوني أو يخش عليه على تشات روم أو يساعد الآخرين أو يشجعهم إن هم يعملوا حاجات خاصة جدا على الإنترنت أو حاجات جنسية أو معلومات جنسية أو معلومات خاصة مخاصة باللي هو تحت السن القانوني. Okay, this is just a continuation of the statute. These are some of the other elements of the cyberbullying statute. Um, I'm just going to move on from there. But the first one, post real or doctored image of a minor on the internet, access alter or erase computer uh, network material, and so forth. It's a, it's a, and it, yeah, it's a long statute, so I, I, I just trying to give you an idea of some of the components of the statute. Again, if your child is engaging in the conduct, they will be charged under this statute for cyberbullying, regardless if they're a child. Okay. Uh, number five, sign up for a pornographic internet site with the intent to intimidate or torment the minor. Um, that would be where one child signs up another child online for different uh, groups that happens all the time, where one child will, as a joke or to have fun, take one child, uh, another child in the school, let's say, and sign them up in all these different uh, groups that are, are, you know, very um, distasteful types of groups, of pornographic groups and stuff like that. <laughs> Okay, so how do we protect against cyberbullying? We want to tell our children to kind of follow these types of rules here. Never respond to unkind remarks. Don't participate in the bullying. Block the, the cyberbully. 
tell a trusted adult, have your children, have a relationship with your children where if they are being bullied, they can come to you and tell you what's going on. In the, a few slides ago, the one child was being bullied, went to the parent, the parent went to the police department, and they ended up charging the other child in the, in the high school. So it's important to have an adult, hopefully your parent, to be able to go to and be able to talk to if your child is being uh, bullied online. Your child most likely, if you, if you don't start developing that relationship with your child now and talking about the internet and cyberbullying and so forth, they may never tell you that they're having issues and that people in school or in the neighborhood are, are basically bullying them online. دي نقاط ضد الحاجات اللي هي الفتوانة الانترنت ما تفرضش على اي معرك جالك اي معلومة جاية ما تخشش في الفتوانة الانترنت بلوكت اقفلها سدها قول لحد كبير سيف الحاجات دي ودي وريها لحد تاني قول لحد في البوليس او قول المدرسة دي مش علمت علمها العيال من الاولاد من العلمة من العلمة Okay, and so what are some of the things we can do as parents? We can address the bad part of the internet. We can shield our children uh, with parent controls, child-friendly search engines. We can bookmark good sites. We can eliminate sites that are not appropriate for the child. And George will be presenting after me on much more in depth on that topic about what we can do electronically to protect our children online. في حاجات الاهالي يعملوها انهم يعملوا كنترول في في ابلكيشنز معينه تتحط اسمها بارنتال كنترول كنترول الاهالي يعملوا كنترول على الكمبيوتر اللي اولادنا شغالين عليه Okay, so this, this slide is talking about pornographic images online. Sexting is a term used to describe the sending or receiving of sexually explicit messages. Understand the obvious is you either are sending material or you're receiving material. There is no other option. Either you or your children are sending out material online or you're receiving material online. The question is, what is the legality of the material that's going back and forth? Okay, sexting would be a person, as Abuna had explained earlier, taking pictures of themselves in, in the nude, basically, and sending it out to a person that they know or that they have a relationship with, um, and that person takes that message and then sends it out to, uh, to every conceivable person that that person knows or every type or even posting it up on social media. So this is a, this is a problem uh, in most states. So North Carolina relies on the general statutes that govern, um, that govern pornographic material. We don't have a specific statute in North Carolina that deals with sexting specifically. We have a child pornography slash uh, distribution of pornographic material statute that applies and they take that general statute and would apply it to any of the situations that evolve online with inappropriate uh, images being transferred back and forth. Um, you want to do best on that? The sex thing about an cell or istibad a sower or a say, you can see a lot of video on the electronic more about texting, right? This text message. Now, this, this statute, texting is just one m method of moving pornographic materials back and forth. Through text message. Sext sexting, the reason, I'm just taking this as one example of moving pornographic material back and forth, and that 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 is very um, prevalent among children. They, the the studies are showing that it's anywhere from like 37 to 40 percent of children will engage in some sort of, of sexting, whether it be a, a full exposure, a partial exposure, uh, and so forth. So this is one of the main 
main categories that you want to keep your eye on and not so much even for your children doing it but other children doing it and sending it to your child and then your child not not telling you about that but I want to clarify this is through text messages not this is not right. social media well it evolves social media because ultimately texting before we get to the text we go online to get the image Okay, so so somebody pulls down the image and, and may very well send it out on a text. The person who receives the text has, has many options. As you know, they can take the image and put it up onto a Facebook um, uh, platform. They can put it on, on an online medium. They can change the medium from the cell phone or, or the, um, the, the text message and, and give it back out on the medium in terms of social uh, networks and so forth. So yes, it, but sexting is a specific type of, right now, texting is really, for children, texting is the number one way of communicating. The children don't go on and send each other emails, okay? So they're all using the cell phone, they're all texting each other, and all the material that they're texting back and forth maybe is pulled down from a social site, or when it's received, it, many times it's put up onto a social uh, media site, so yes. أقول بس حتى حتى قالها إنه قالت في سبعة وثلاثين لأربعين في المية من الأولاد بيبعثوا رسائل جنسية لبعض أو بيستقبلوها سواء رسائل دي على التليفونات وعلى الجانب نمرة واحد أكثر حاجة بيستعملوها الأولاد دلوقتي هي التكست مسجز أكثر من أي حاجة ودي دلوقتي بين سبعة وثلاثين لأربعين في المية الأولاد بيستعملوها وممكن سواء الراسل أو المستقبل بيبقى بياخد حاجة جنسية أو فيديو أو صور and so the last two bullet points are important. The, distrib the distribution of sexually explicit images amongst minors is considered child pornography, which is a felony in North Carolina. North Carolina does not have a specific law that addresses sexting behavior. It's considered the distribution of pornographic uh, material. Uh, and as long as North Carolina child pornography laws are used to govern sexting behavior among minors, North Carolina minors are at the risk of being charged and convicted of felonies. So you're, again, we get back to the legal trap in North Carolina. There is no s specific statutes to address the children only. There are general statutes that are applied to adults and children. So think about it, if you were drafting a statute and you were considering what the penalty should be, if it was a statute that was only going to be applied to juveniles, you may have a whole different um, philosophy about how the penalty and what the penalty should be, as opposed to a uh, statute that will, uh, will apply to adults, a whole different type of penalty. So in North Carolina, again, the, the adult statutes are applied to the children in this area. Okay. Another of the main categories, malicious files, and so these involve viruses, spyware, uh, malware, and so forth. And again, George will be talking more about that. But passing on those, passing on those communications with viruses in them, I guess the, the next type of uh, the next question you may want to ask: Well, what ha what happens if I infect somebody else's computer? What happens if I pass on a virus to uh, friends and then it corrupts files in their network? Am I, is there any liability on my side? Uh, and there could be, there could be civil liability through the parent. The parent would actually have to uh, deal with that. So be cautious about the information coming in and out and where your children are visiting and the types of messages they're sending back and forth. <laughs> And understand that vi there are people that send viruses on purpose, right? They're not just something that we get online as a result of browsing. 
people specifically and purposefully uh, send viruses and malware to other people. So we want to make sure that um, you're not receiving that in, in, on your networks and your children are not in fact sending that type of material out. He can actually uh, take to court somebody for doing that. Yes. Do that, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is a a um, North Carolina statute that talks about it, accessing somebody else's drives, their computer, their networks, and so forth. And so. This is some of some of the information and, and some of the laws that apply. Sometimes kids will get together, they'll start trying to hack into the local school, they'll, they'll try to hack into the library, they'll try to hack into their friends' networks and so forth, computers. Understand that there are, there are statutes against that. Um, and we do have at least one example here, and I'll, I'll, why don't you say that, then we'll talk about the example. Okay, so we have an example. How many people here are from Cary? Okay. How many people have heard of Panther Creek High School in Cary? It's one of the main high schools. Um, a few years ago, a young man, 17-year-old, a minor, right, not 18 yet, decided to uh, try to hack into Panther Creek's network and try to change some of the outcomes of some of the grades and actually was successful in doing that. <laughs> uh, it was picked up right away and, and the, uh, the child was arrested, right? And so he was arrested and he was charged with a felony at 17 years of age. Now here's the funny part. The child is volunteering at the local library. Why? Why do you think he was volunteering at the local library? He's trying to build his college resume. Okay, he's going to volunteer here, he's going to volunteer there. He wants to build that college resume so that when he sends in that application, he's got all these different activities that he did. Unfortunately, he used the library computer to pull off this hack and was eventually arrested and charged. So I don't know what he's going to put on his college application that he was charged with a felony for hacking the school and changing his grades. So it, it's just ironic that the, the, you know, he's using the computer in the place where he's trying to do the volunteer work to get into college, and this is just absolutely going to crush him. I'm sure, I, I don't know whatever happened to the child, but um, I'm sure, you know, he may not, he may be working right now out and not in college, who knows. But understand that, um, that you will be charged. The police have the capability of tracking all this back, by the way. Don't think that, I mean, there's nobody that's going to be sophisticated enough to be able to disguise who they are even if they're trying to use other people's logons and all that, eventually it all works out in the end. The police have different levels of sophistication. They have a, a level of sophistication to be able to solve cyber crimes within their own department. Then they can go to a county level. They can then go to the federal level. And they have access to all different modalities of, of getting to the bottom of a case because there's cooperation among law enforcement agencies. So potentially something happening at the local level here in Chapel Hill, if it, if it rose to the level of importance uh, enough to justify calling in the FBI's cyber, uh, cyber squad, then they can do it. And they probably do it all the time. So understand that um, really, right? He, he wanted people to believe that it was a patron in the library using the open access um, portal where you can just go on, sit down, and, and, and maybe thought that nobody would understand who he was and, and so forth, but it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, 
And I want to point out, you'll see here where it says he had to, uh, he was released on a $15,000 bond. Right, so let me, let me explain what that is. You may not know what that is. When somebody's arrested and charged with a crime, we want to, the, the, the law enforcement wants to ensure that the person will come back for trial, right? So they do this through a, through a bond. And basically what happens is, or, or bail, they, they take in a, a certain amount of money um, and they hold it until that court case comes up. And once it comes up, they start to release the money back to the defendant. And you can always get a, an idea of the attitude law enforcement or prosecution has on certain crimes. You may have a crime that's important to you. You think you may be shocked that somebody would uh, commit a certain crime and the, there may be no bail. There may be $1,500 bail, very low. And so it kind of, it does kind of give a, a, an idea about the attitude towards the crime that, um, that criminal justice has about that specific crime. I would consider this at $15,000 for a hacking of a school network to be pretty high. Mm -hmm. That's a high bail, 15,000. I mean, I could tell you there are uh, persons that have uh, theft and, and, and assault charges and so forth that their bails would never be that high. I First time, I know this from North Carolina. First time a man beats his wife, never done it before, $500. Okay. He does it again, it's $2,000. I've never heard about 15,000. Okay, so 15,000 is pretty excessive. So don't, don't look for sympathy. If the, the idea here is you're probably not going to get a whole lot of sympathy from the court if you have to go into court and, and say that, you know, and, and look, look to the court to be uh, merciful on you. Um, probably not going to happen on that. Okay, so the other, the third of the uh, categories was the sexual predators. They masquerade as, as children on lines. Um, they also trick children to re revealing personal information about themselves and they lure children and teenagers to a meeting spot. Seems pretty common. Um, uh, rapists, I don't know what you want to say. <laughs> Fishing, fishing for children. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Okay. Here we have another local news item, um, North Carolina, out of Charlotte. A parent was concerned about inappropriate messages uh, brought by his 15-year-old son's cell phone uh, to the FBI, um, and essentially the, the person, he was a middle school boy and he thought he was talking to an older female. And the agent uh, recalled the boy had met her on Instagram and talked to her for months before she asked for naked pictures of the child. And the, the person was actually a 22 year old man by the name of Patrick Killen Jr. So this is a situation where you have a juvenile, a 15-year-old child on Instagram going back and forth with what he believed to be an older female. As it turns out, it was an older, it was a 22-year-old male. And that male had 
persuaded that child to send some pictures of himself naked. So the 15-year-old was sending uh, inappropriate pictures of himself to the 22-year-old male, believing it was going to the female. واحد عمل نفسه واحدة فالواحدة دي أو شخصة دي بتطلب أو أكشولي راجل أو شاب عنده 22 سنة بيطلب صور عريانة من الشمس هو دلوقتي واحدة هو لغاية دلوقتي واحدة Until now, he's a, he's a girl. That's confusing us. Oh, did I confuse you? It's, no, no, no. Oh, okay. It's confusing. He's trying to say he's a male, trying to act like a female. Yes, right. right. Online. Online. So I'm just saying, until now, he's a female. Yes. Until now, he's a female. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay, yeah, the question, the question is, going back to the previous slide about bail and the, and, and the bond at $15,000, if, if, well, the bail is $15,000, that's the fee for the child to get out of jail. Okay, the bond, a bond is essentially a loan, meaning the parent can post what's called a bond. They can go to a loan officer, a bondsman, and they can say to the loan officer, my child is in jail, has a $15,000 bail. I don't have $15,000. Will you lend me the money to get my child out of jail? And the bondsman will say, sure, you're going to pay 10% or 15% of that to me as my fee, and I'll put up the remainder of the money in a form of a bond. Yeah, so, yes, and you're beyond that, the question is, well, what happens if so? The first step would be for the parent to try to get a bond because they probably don't have $15,000 cash in your bank account. And then, so the second thing would be if they couldn't get a bond and couldn't afford the 10%, the child will remain in custody until the hearing. And, and that's the same thing with adults, right? So the adult will remain in the county jail until the trial. But if they can't post bond. The bonds, man? There's various companies, bondsmen are private groups. There are various companies. Um, there's not a bank. It's not quite regulated like a bank, but there are bonds. They're called bond, bondsmen agencies. <laughs> The bondsman takes 10% of that once they go to court. The court will send the bondsman their cut. And then the court will then send who, the, the person who put who has the bond the remainder of it. Yeah. So, yeah. And so the the most important part here. This is the couple of things on this story. The parent didn't go to the local police department about this. They she went to the FBI. She walked into the FBI's office, right? And so and they acted on it. I'm surprised because usually the FBI will act on only higher level types of crimes because they have limited resources. Um, so the parent was able to get to the FBI and get them to do something. And beyond that, the agent for the FBI made a comment that, um, that the person, the victim, will be victimized over and over and over for years to come. And what do you think he meant by that? 
There's pictures, once the picture goes out of the child naked, it's out in Cyberland, and that, that picture can be moved around, posted, it never goes away. So let me ask a question while we're talking about that. How many of us in this room made, made some mistakes as children, you know, as teenagers, that we wish we probably didn't make? Anybody? Good. Nobody. No. You guys are the, the, okay. So has anybody ever done anything as a teenager where you regret? Good. Yes, sir. Nobody? Okay. My, this is a great Coptic church. We're doing great. <laughs> right? Okay. So I, I would think that everybody did something when you were 15, let's say, that you may regret, right? And nobody else knows about it because probably when we were growing up, we didn't have a whole lot of internet stuff and cell phones and any of that. I mean, I grew up with no, you know, there wasn't the internet when I was growing up. It wasn't until I was about 23 years old that the internet even came out, I think. Um, so how many of us who made mistakes took a, a notebook and every time we made an embarrassing mistake or did something we regret, we wrote it down and made a list and kept the list going every time we made a mistake. Did anybody do that here? Nobody took out a notebook and wrote down every mistake you made? No? Okay. Okay, so your children, when they make a mistake and if they're up online, the notebook is the online platform because once they make the mistake and go up online with it, you can't take it back, it's recorded and it can come back to haunt the person and cause problems down the road. So when we go online, we make a mistake, you can't pull it back. It's out there. I'll give you an example. I was on a um, hiring committee in the police department that I used to work in and we had a candidate that came in, sat down for an interview and at the end of the interview we we put up on the screen, just like a screen like that, we say, can you explain this? And it was him wearing a dress on, taken from a Facebook social media posting. Somebody put it up online and we were doing our background investigation. We saw the pictures and we confronted the candidate with the pictures in the interview. I think the, the kid had to, had to gather himself together, it was just not, not a kid, 24, 25 year old uh, adult, had to kind of compose himself and explain why he was up on our screen during a job interview in a dress. Um, yeah, I don't think you can get all that out, but... <laughs> huh? Yeah, so I'll tell you the end, what happened with that. Okay. And the end of the story was he, once he gathered his composure in the interview, he was then went on to tell us that people took pictures of him at a Halloween party where he decided to dress like a female and posted it up on, on an internet site, uh, Facebook and some of the other social media sites and tried to make it look like this person was a cross-dresser, what we call a cross-dresser, not putting any of the context of the picture that it was a Halloween party and that he'll never do it again. And, his own, and begged us basically to let it go. And uh, we hired that person, by the way, and it was a Halloween party, and it, the person was actually a great candidate. But, you know, and, and we, we hired the person because of the way the person 
responded to us challenging him and the way the person was able to systematically explain what had happened, how much embarrassment this caused him, who were the people that had taken the pictures and posted them and, and, and these pictures, and how many times at, to that point he had to explain this in other job interviews and so forth. So again, when we make mistakes on the internet, they don't go away, right? Okay. Okay. Another, another example, I'm going to move a little bit quicker because I know we're probably... We're going to keep this one for next Sunday, I asked her. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have everybody for next Sunday, so... Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so, another example, this is out of um, a town called Lawndale, North Carolina. This is a gentleman who went on to, on to the uh, gaming, the Xbox gaming uh, uh, platform, and was able to befriend 10 and 10, uh, children between the age of 10 and 15 years of age, and was able to get the children to send pictures of them in the nude. To, the, uh, to this person um, who was an adult. Uh, that person was ultimately uh, arrested and, co and convicted in Gaston County, uh, North Carolina. So it happens, and again, I want to reiterate, don't, don't think that when your kid's up on Xbox for three hours or four hours that they're not communicating online to people all over the country all over the world actually and there are predators that go on to those platforms and do the same thing they would do in other in other mediums <laughs> oh, okay back so here's some of the things we can do. We want, to, we, we want to keep our personal information private. We never want to reveal a name, an address, phone number, school name. We don't want to, uh, I don't know why that's cut off. Uh, we don't want to post uh, pictures of ourselves online, obviously. Uh, we don't want to uh, choose, we want to choose a non-descriptive screen name. So we want to, if we use a screen name, if the children are using screen names in some of the acceptable platforms you want to you, you want to pick names that are neutral and that don't reveal um, what the person does or, or what type of person he or she is <laughs> Okay. Gamers and privacy. This is a, an online gamer pressured an eight-year-old boy uh, playing Fortnite, which is a very Fortnite. Has anybody heard of Fortnite? It's a very popular game that teenagers um, in that 12-year-old, 13-year-old range, they're all, on, all using Fortnite. If they're not using it in your home, rest assured they're in their friend's home using it. Okay? Uh, very popular. So this was um, 
a situation where they convinced the eight-year-old to send photos of his mother's driver's license and uh, credit cards and, and ID. And so the child sent it out and as soon as, the, as soon as the people on the other end playing the game received that information, they started to do their thing, right? And um, so they also asked for, the, for visa cards and so forth. So what do you think they started doing? They had the license, they had the credit card, they're buying all kinds of stuff online, right? And, and these are kids in different states. And so let me just tell you, good luck trying to get an investigation to leave North Carolina. So if, if you have an online incident where your, your identity is taken and your credit card is run up or, or, or compromised, nor, and, and the people that are doing it are believed to be in another state, you're basically at the end of the road at that point. There's really, law enforcement's really not going to take that local case and try to investigate it and go after that person. They're going to say, well, the crime happened in Minnesota or it happened in, an, in another place, and it's up to them to, to deal with that. So you're really not going to have a lot of recourse once your information gets out on the internet, especially if it crosses state lines. Okay? ثمان سنين في مينيسوتا وغاية تانية ومع واحد تاني هنا من نورث كارولانا كان بيلعبوا جيم اسمها فورتنايت فيديو جيم اللي بيلعب الكبير ده او الشخص التاني ده طلب درايفر الرخصة بتاعت الام بتاعت الولد اللي عنده ثمان سنين والفيزا والكارد وكده الولد راح للشنطة والدته في امه ومسكته وهو بيدور في ال الدرس بتاعها في الشنطه بتاعتها آه كان عايز يبعت له الانفورميشن دي عشان الشخص طبعا بجد انه خد الرخصه او الفيزا كارد وكل ده هيعمل حاجات ثانيه بيها فبيقول هو انه لما يكون في واحد من ولايه وولايه ثانيه بالنسبه لنورث كارولاينا هنا صعب قوي اكنك وصلت من هذا الطريق صعب قوي بقى الانفستيجيشن والتحديات بتاعتها يقول لك شوف التحديات في الولايه الثانيه most probably it happens a lot. That's why you don't yes. have to worry Yeah, this, this happens all the time. In this situation, the child, with the, the boy was in Minnesota, but the person that was getting the information okay. was in North Carolina. So. Can, I, can I add two points? Sure. Sometimes people say, no, I know my kids. They're not going to do that. Right. But the numbers you said says otherwise. Right. 37%. He's 37 to 40 percent in the sexting, right? This uh -huh. is this is among gamers. This is going to be. going to be higher. It's going to be very high. Yeah. Between one third and half of all kids are going to be involved in some kind of that. I mean, to 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 sit here and assume that your child is not going to engage in any of this stuff, you're you're just fooling yourself. Okay. Um, you can your child can be you know a saint and all that, but um, ultimately you have to take steps as the parent to ensure that your child is not engaging in this. So I always say, and inspect what you expect, right? You don't expect your children to engage in this behavior, but that doesn't mean you sit back and just, you know, don't you know, entrust the child. That's a child. You need to inspect what the child's doing. So you don't want to be surprised down the road that your child has been doing all kinds of things that you have no idea about. And remember, when the child goes into somebody else's home, now they're under their rules and they can do, many children have a lot of flexibility, they're unsupervised all day, and um, your child goes into that environment and just starts participating in that. So inspect what you expect. You expect something, you need to make sure that that's what's happening. That's, that's called parenting, by the way, and we all have to do that, right? It's easy for us not to get involved with that um, and not to be so um, affirmative in going out and trying to make sure what our children are doing, but it's work. Let's face it, parenting is work and that's part of the work. It's part of the job. What's that? How do you inspect? Okay, so for example, how, how do you inspect? Well, what, to, you first of all, you want to first of all, you want to set up the rules that allow you to inspect. So if I give my child a cell phone, I tell the child it's my cell phone. You're using it. I there's the password. I will know the password. And when I ask for the cell phone periodically to get an idea of what you're doing on it, you're going to hand it over to me. 
And we're not going to argue, we're not going to fight, because if, if that's what happens, then there's a penalty. I'll take the cell phone until you come back around to my way of thinking. So in terms of inspecting text messages, emails, and different things on, and pictures and photos on your child's cell phone, okay, you as the parent, it's your cell phone. You're letting the child use it. There should be nothing on that cell phone that should be shocking to you. Otherwise, your child is doing things they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, but what about if they have their cell phone? What's that? What about if they have their own cell phone? Who has their own cell phone? What, at what age? <coughs> like middle school. Like, uh, okay, but when you say have their own cell phone, they got a job, went out, and they're paying Verizon, okay. and they went to the store and bought the cell phone? Or I, I, what do you mean they have their own cell phone? No. No, they don't have their own cell phone. It's your cell phone because when we get to the parent liability statutes, the law is going to say it's your cell phone. And the law is going to say you didn't supervise. And the law is going to say that you're responsible for your child's conduct. So, you know, I always, tell, I always say it this way, and this is my philosophy as a, when I was a supervisor and so forth um, in the police department. I used to say, if, if the ship is going to go down and sink, it, it, you know, then it's going to sink doing it my way, right? If I'm responsible for something and we're going to, and the ship is going to sink based on my responsibility, then I'm going to make sure it was my way that we did it, okay? Meaning that I'm going to make the rules on this because I'm responsible for it. And if it goes down, it, it's going to be on me. But I'm not going to follow your rules, right? Somebody else's rules and be responsible for it. So the, the point is that the phones are yours, the iPads are yours, the network is yours, the payments are made by you. Um, that sh you have to have that relationship and let the child understand that um, and then be able to step in and, and police that. Okay, now I understand what you're saying because it, it's, it, believe me, you're, you're looking at it too from a privacy perspective and trust perspective and so forth. You know, it's the child's cell phone. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so the, you know, the, they may have a password on the phone and then all their various networks they'll have um, passwords on. So, I mean, I, from a starting point, do you actually know what networks your children are on? Right? You, you know, you, again, this is something where you, you start the, start the uh, conversation now when the children are young and let them understand this, okay? Because you have to have some type, how can you be responsible for your child if you have no idea what your child's doing online? You have to have a way to be able to break that barrier. باختصار انه كان في سؤال طب ايه الحدود اللي عاملها وازاي احط حدود فالرد جون قال انتوا الاهالي تحطوا القواعد والقوانين اللي تتعاملوا بيها مع اولادكم عشان ما يحصلش اي عدم تفاهم وخناقه مع الاولاد هدا وهدا فلازم انتوا كاهالي تحطوا القواعد والاساسيات اللي هتبنوا عليها العلاقه في معامله التليفونات التليفونات الحاجه الثانيه لو طب ده التليفون بتاع ابني فكان رده بيقول انه ده التليفون مش بتاع ابنك او بنتك التليفون بتاعك كبير مكتوب باسمك بشخصك انت كل ما في الامر اديله التليفون ده ما راحش فرايزر ولا اي تي ان تي ولا حاجه زي كده واشتراه اللي اشتراه وعمل كل الحاجه دي الاب والام فلو سمحتوا تراجعوا بيعملوا ايه وفي اي وقت محتاجين التليفون ده اهو تشوفوا تشوفوا الويب سايت اللي بيروحها تشوفوا اللي بينزلها الحاجات اللي بينزلها على الانترنت بالتليفون وكل تصرفاتهم على التليفون الباسورد بتاعتكم انتم مش بتاعته هو Okay, so those are the, that's one way of dealing with it. The other, these are some of the other suggestions. Um, sign a contract with your child when you allow them to have a cell phone. Let them know what the rules are up front. We have access to it. We'll periodically ask for it. We're going to monitor what you're doing. Uh, keep the computer in a, in a open area in the house. In our kitchen at home, we bought a desk. You know, and doesn't look the greatest because it's a desk in the kitchen, but we put the desk in the kitchen in, in a little breakfast nook area, and we put the computer up on the desk. So when the, when the child's going to use the computer, um, we're going to be able to see it. Even, I mean, we're not going to stare at it, and, and we'll, you know, but when we walk by, obviously, 
uh, we can see what's going on. We know what, when they're doing homework, when they're doing something else, and so forth. The worst thing you can do is put the computer up in the bedroom and say, okay, I'm, I'm going up to do be at nighttime. There should be a time when the child leaves the cell phone with you or in a neutral spot. They should not be taking the phone to bed with them. Okay? Again, this is going to cause conflict. I understand that. My house is nothing but we set the rules, the rules get broken, we take the phones, we hold them for a week or two, we start over again. And it's just never ending process of back and forth. I'm not here to tell you that my family is, you know, is doing a great job with this, okay? We're struggling through it just like you. And, but you have to at least struggle through it. You have to have some controls on it, all right? Because your, your child, when they get older, they're going to turn to you if, they're, if things don't work out for them. And they're going to, the first thing they're going to tell you is, you, didn't, you weren't a good parent. You didn't stop me from doing it. I was the child. You were the parent. They're not going to thank you down the road. Trust me. They won't thank you. They're going to uh, condemn your parenting when they get older if something negative comes out of it. They don't get that job they want. They don't get into that college they want. Something embarrassing happens to them. They're going to look back at you and say, you were the parent, I was the child. Understand that that's how normally it's going to work, okay? Yeah. Set time limits and become familiar with the different sites that your kids are on. And who are your child's online friends? Know your child's passwords and keep your security software up to date. بيقول لازم برضه نرجع لموضوع نحط القوانين والقواعد في البيت حتى بيتكلم عن حتى بيته برضه في شد وجذب ما بين مع اولاده نحط الكمبيوتر في حته واضحه مثلا في المطبخ حتى لو هو مش حاطط الاماكن يتحط فيها ما ياخدش التليفون يقعد فوق في الاوضه بتاعته يقرا اربع خمس ساعات وكذلك الكمبيوتر نعرف الباسورد بتاعته ونعرف الحاجات اللي بينزلها على اونلاين يبقى دايما قصاد عينه هل حتى في البيت برضه عنده الشد والجذب ده مستمر ياخد تليفون من حد من الولاد لمده اسبوع اسبوعين كان من العقاب يرجعه له تاني يمشي شويه يغلط يغلط تاني او يعمل حاجه مش كويسه ياخد منه التليفون او ياخد من حد في التليفون وهكذا الموضوع مستمر والشاب او الشابه لما يكبروا هيلوموكوا مش هيلوموا حد تاني هيقولوا لكم انتوا ما كنتوش الاهالي لينا مظبوط وانتوا ما ساعدتوناش هنمشي صح Okay. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna kind of wrap up at the end here now. We're gonna talk about parent liability. Um, two kinds of liability for the parent. You have you have criminal liability and you have civil liability. Criminal liability is that you can be charged for an action of your child. North Carolina does have parent liability statutes. Civil liability means you can be a, a, a criminal liability is has a penal con consequence to it right being uh, charged under a criminal statute civil liability is there's no penal consequence to it however there's a financial consequence money damages where you'll pay money out for uh, acts of the children that cause damage to others so two, two types of liability overall it's either criminal or civil sometimes it can be both so North Carolina so North Carolina, their criminal statutes focus on the last two categories here, vicarious liability and strict liability. Vicarious liability means you vicariously assume the liability for your children because of the relationship. Okay, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't do the the act. Maybe your child did, but you're gonna you're gonna be responsible for it through what's called vicarious liability. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Strict liability. This strict liability is where the state of North Carolina says this act 
is going to, the parent will be strictly liable for. There is no argument. You're not going to go to court and argue that the child did this or this act isn't, uh, isn't a crime or whatever the case may be. Strict liability essentially means Person there is no argument. It's almost like personal Wolf. liability. Wolf. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I got, I'm going to pick it. I got to pick the pace up because okay. we're losing people. Okay. You, you want to? Okay. Civil liability focuses on what we call damages. Damages are money damages. Your conduct caused somebody else um, a loss, and you're going to make that person whole again um, through money. You're going to assign a certain amount of money that you're going to be liable for. So if your child goes in, like the child in Panther Creek, and let's say when he went into the school network, he, he caused all kinds of damage to the network, viruses and so forth, and the school had to go out and spend $100,000 to repair the network, call in consultants, and so forth. They can go after you as the parent for that cost. That's a civil liability. You're going to make the school whole again. You're going to pay for that cost so the school does not have to absorb this is just a comparison between the two types of liability. Again, criminal, uh, North Carolina focuses down here. Um, and then civil, all, f all of these categories would apply. Strict liability, vicarious negligence, and intentional tort. Um, I'm just trying to just give you an idea about that. Uh, we can have uh, seminars all day and night on that stuff. So, But ultimately, understand that there's two types of liability. One is where you have to pay out money to make things right and the other is where there's a penal violation there's a a penal aspect to it you're punished for it and that's the criminal liability Okay, I've kind of explained this already. Um, some of the characteristics of criminal liability is that the person purposely, knowingly, recklessly committed the act. Um, and so these are just some of the different categories. Vicarious liability, persons without fault is held liable for conduct of another. And strict liability is where, it, it's where no requirement to be aware of the elements of the offense. It means that you, didn't, you, you can't argue with strict liability that I didn't know it was a crime. I didn't know it means nothing. Strict liability in North Carolina means you're liable for it uh, from a criminal aspect regardless. Okay? Um, in, in terms of civil liability, this is kind of an explained. This is really where most of the liability will be. Um, not so much intent, it will be on negligence and so forth. And, and damages paid on that end of it. Some of the intentional torts will also cause um, civil liability. Acting with intent, uh, breaching a duty. If you're a parent and your child does something intentionally on the internet to cause damage, and now they're trying to sue you, you're going to be sued under negligence because you, you, you did not uh, supervise your child, right? You, did not, you, you were negligent in supervising your children. Okay. <coughs> Okay, here's the here's uh, the parent liability statutes in North Carolina. 
Strict liability for damage to person or property by minors, the parents responsible under this statute. And the other main one is negligent supervision of a minor. These are the two main uh, statutes in North Carolina. You had asked me early on about parent liability. You'll most likely be charged under one of these two statutes if your child is doing something they shouldn't be doing online. Okay? Um, so obviously the parent has got a, has an affirmative duty to know what the children are doing, to provide the supervision. You can't, you can't just sit back and say, well, that's their privacy and I didn't want to interrupt that. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do that and you're going to have some conflict with your children. Just you know, understand that that's going to happen. It's, it's just, it comes with the territory, okay? <laughs> So this slide is, we're kind of almost at the end of the presentation, and I put this in here, and I already told you the story about some, you know, you know, the child that was at Panther Creek, and I told you the story about the person that we were going to hire. So these all have concerns. I asked you how many of you wrote down your mistakes as a child and kept a log of them, and then nobody said they did, and rightfully so. I don't think anybody would do that. But when that stuff is out on the internet, we, we do worry about the future because those things aren't going away. Your, the child can be victimized over and over. College applications, advanced degree, you know, going for graduate work, job applications, licensing applications, background checks. And you may have background checks for all different co engineers working for co government contractors and so forth, uh, people going into public office. Um, even background checks for camp counselors, public employment, etc. So this stuff has consequences down the road because somebody's tracking it. It's all going to be out there. Again, get a hold of what your kids are doing and, and know what they're doing. So this is the last slide.